Jim, we are back. Season five, episode two. Today, we're talking evaluations. So when it comes to evaluations, what are some of the things we need to be thinking about? There's a couple of ways you want to think about in terms of the direction and the vector you want to start with someone, right? I don't know you. Great to meet you. Maybe I do know you, but I still need to get some baseline information or updated information. You want to break it up into what's going to have an influence on your program directly, and then what's going to have some sort of thing that you want to figure out at the end, relatively speaking, to the beginning. So we'll start off with what's going to have an impact on your program directly. You need to know what exercise you're going to choose, and you need to know what variables you're going to select with those exercises, right? So exercises are the conduits to managing and improving certain qualities, like being stronger or being more powerful or being faster. And that's essentially the 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 approach you want to take from any evaluation process because one of the the rubs on doing any evaluations time it's energy it's inertia it's a lot of stuff you have to consider so if it has no influence on the decisions you were doing like if you're going to do the same program regardless of the evaluation completely get why you wouldn't want to do an evaluation i think that's wrong no i just flat out do because if i'm looking at you like i already know your problem and therefore I already formed a solution i think i'm not doing as enough due diligence on my end to have a really effective program for you. And it gets into this, like, again, this other aspect of, well, how much nuance and customization can we really have in a one-on-one or a group setting? And all of that being said, it's just, it's better to know that information than not know that information. And it's better to have at least an idea of what you're working with collectively, as opposed to not working with that information. And then the other end is when we get to that intersection of that program, that was generic. Now, I don't want to say generic in a very like not insulting way, but it is a generic approach of I have to apply this universal program to a large group of athletes, and they're all beautiful individual snowflakes, that I have to have some sort of contingency in play to manage that when it no longer is effective, right? We're all going to be faced with a triage of variations of exercises that we can't do. And then we're all going to met with this diminishing return aspect from a physiological perspective and what we can do from a variable selection. So no matter what, you're going to face this head on in regards to there's going to be some customization, whether I do it at the front end or I'm going to have to do it in the middle and not be the place to start, right? What exercises are going to have the biggest impact on improving their performance? And then what variables align with those exercises from sets, rest, time of retention, rest, intensity? they're going to have the biggest net impact overall. And then you look at it from the, okay, well, I need to essentially establish some sort of objective of training, right? We, we had a pre-mortem, like we talked about with goals last week, and we're starting to think about what is going to be the biggest impact to changing the course of our program or getting the outcome that we want. And then a lot of times it's, it's a very nebulous term. Like I want to get faster, right? And that's, that's usually off the premise of like straight ahead speed because that's the most quantifiable. So if I'm like going to do a 40 yard dash test with a football player, like that's a very simple, intuitive, logical way to look at speed, not a hundred percent applicable, but it's something that we could standardize and we could see the cause and effect relationship from the training decisions that we make. So let's say collectively all agree upon if I'm running across the line from A to B faster, that I'm more prepared to play football on a higher level. And now I have some sort of direct thing. I'm evaluating my baseline and then my outcome. And that in itself goes back into did I or did not make improvement. And we have to go back to the, the overall hypothesis of training that I did these exercises, these sets, rep, time, retention, rest, intensity, and this much frequency within a micro cycle over a course of certain meso cycle and macro cycle. And I garnered what for an outcome. And if it was good, okay, great. I had the right hypothesis of the training. If it was bad, maybe I didn't get improvement or maybe I regressed. We have to evaluate now twofold. One, what was the hypothesis as well as what was the quality? And that ongoing assessment of what we're doing from appraising our ability as coaching, praising our, our programming decisions, praising our amendment to that, all that has a place in regards to looking at that baseline information. So I don't know you or I do know you. I don't know what I want to accomplish. I learned that. And then I start to figure out what exercises, variables I need to assign for that. And then I look at what am I going to ultimately be assessed on from a progress perspective and getting into this pre and post testing. Are there any evaluations or tests that you would say like every athlete needs to do this or anything that would be consistent or is it all just based off of that, you know, that pre-mortem, what, what you decide as a group or a staff that needs to get accomplished? Yeah. uh, That's a really good question. Cause when we get into this, 
there's going to be some preference, right? So your bias, your association with testing, right? You might have an affinity for a certain system of testing and, and, not, and another one not. I, when I think about what is going to be a universally accepted testing, and I, I generally look at this from a, an athlete profiling and then go all the way back to uh, super training, science of practice, anything that we're trying to get a general temperature check on general physical preparation or GPP, it gets in this like spider chart, like, like demo of what is an athlete, right? Can they run fast? Can they jump high? Can they projectile implement like a shot put or a med ball? Maybe we throw in there their body composition or lean body mass to body fat ratio. Maybe we throw in there their fitness levels through a VO2 max or direct cardiovascular assessment or fitness assessment. Maybe we look at it from their change direction ability. You know, these big quote unquote objectives that have a direct impact on training that are general enough that we can apply general stimulus and improve upon. And we can quantify our level of impact on that. And it might get into this discussion on correspondent where general physical preparation is not designed to correspond to hundred percent in a linear way, but it does if it's deficient, right? And that's, I think that's part of often lost in the SPP, GPP, just to get the futile conversation to be completely frank at the association with athletes that are underdeveloped or deficient are going to need general physical preparation and development. So that has a huge impact on performance It's when they are physically developed and there already are outliers in these general qualities that yes, specific preparation becomes more important, but the majority of the people that we work with are generally deficient. So it's going to have a huge residual, no matter what way you want to cut it and how we want to like associate whatever it is we do training wise into some sort of impact on performance. But that like, what is a universal thing? Are they running faster? And you could quantify that as like point A to point B, like did a 20 yard dash or a 40 yard dash, maybe do a hundred meter. Are they jumping higher or further, right? Vertical jump or broad jump. We could break that down to subcategories. Like we do a strength deficit, looking at a counter movement versus non counter movement jump. We can look at it from a reactivity standpoint, from like a depth jump protocol, a rate of force development, looking at weighted jumps. We can look at it from a reactivity perspective of like a hop test, which is the same as a repeat jump test or a pet to jump where we do a broad jump. So that jumping is a second category. Then we look at, I like just projectile, right? Can I throw something further, which gets into this like athleticism, lever, power kind of continuum that is mm -hmm. like this Venn diagram of those things that the, in the middle, if someone could throw a fixed object further or higher, they're typically leveraging all those components together between their body length, their athleticism and their overall power or strength. And then we get into this fitness component and can I handle a certain level of density or duration at an efficient manner? Body composition, I think is another big one. Do I have enough lean body mass and and, and a minimal amount of fat mass to be efficient. Then we get into maybe some other stuff like change of direction, which is might get a little bit dicey in terms of quantifying. And you find kids are just really apt to, to latching onto the test and what that means. So for instance, a pro agility or L drill, it's easy to get good at that stuff by just knowing how to position yourself and timing. Doesn't necessarily mean you're better at change of direction, but doesn't discount the value of, of training, change of direction and chaining these things to improve that and using that as some sort of quantifiable aspect. But you can look at a little bit more chaotic drills of, you can look at more curvilinear running, you can look at open-sided games. You can look at a bunch of different stuff that we're getting better at being able to quantify and organize into training. We could probably get a lot of the information that we're trying to figure out and change direction from a, just a good jump profile now with good force plates and looking at eccentric load, uh, rate of force development, um, peak power per body mass ratio, RSI, all these things are just now available to us pretty democratized wise, right? Like everyone at some way, shape or form can extrapolate a lot of this data that we're trying to figure out for what's going to make someone more efficient and change direction. So maybe that's a test we can eliminate by just lumping that into a test that we're already doing. Maybe not. Those are all really important things from a general, like universal thing. And at the end of the day, like. One of the things I generally advocate for with coaches is like, you should be able to explain it to a parent or you should be able to explain it to a football coach that you are effective at your job and to the, having some sort of 
really bridge that, hey, they're running faster, they're jumping higher, they're throwing med balls further, they're better fitness and their body composition's improved, that they're going to go, okay, you give me a better start point to enhance this kid's ability to play this position or this sport. And after that, yeah, we have to cross some bridges and the, the work's still not done. But if I'm looking at it from a, a strength conditioning perspective, performance enhancement perspective, it's, it's good to have some sort of universal thought of what is actually our job and objectively evaluating that. And we have enough objective hardware to evaluate this on a very high level reliably, right? I can, we have enough time engaged out there. We have enough force plates out there. We have enough things like velocity-based training that thinks the clouds that look at rate of force development profiling or force velocity profiling. We have enough of this stuff that's widely available and objective that we can kind of really compare and contrast. And it's hard to cheat some of the stuff now. Like I can teach a kid to jump higher in a vertex within a minute, you know, and I can teach a kid how to run a faster pro agility within a minute. Like I can do these things. Doesn't necessarily mean I'm better athlete. It just means that I've trained that kid to be better at that test. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think now we've kind of, obviously the, there always will be people who try to quote unquote hack the system, but you ain't gonna get money for running the fastest 40, but you will maybe, yeah, I should, I can take that back. You will now, cause we see combine that happen all the time. People get drafted off that pretense alone, but you know, the objectively evaluating it, like the real value is now you're faster. And now that gives you a better platform to be better at football. And I think that's important, man. I really do. And I, I think we need to not get too locked in onto that stuff, but we also should Definitely not diminish the value of that and not just cast it away when we don't make improvement. You know, just saying it's not important when we don't make changes on it because it's irrelevant towards the sport. Well, it's still relevant towards the things that you're doing from a training perspective. And let's say that you are doing a combination of push, pull, hinge, and squat, or you're doing a certain linear speed progressions, or you're doing multi directional speed, or you're doing any kind of organization of your training that is in part based off the premise of I'm trying to improve these general qualities of speed, power, strength, body composition, et cetera. And then you get into a little bit just more nuance, right? Does a offensive lineman need a little bit different things to look at versus a wide receiver? And that kind of gets into this specific archetyping stuff I do with strength deficit. And I think there's plenty of other things that are similar in that in terms of like, let's figure out what the assignment is and let's start to organize our testing to to meet the demands of that position or that sport. But from a general perspective, like their golf, their water polo, their football, their basketball, their baseball, their cross country, like I think we should have an, a, a diagnostic on what is their current level of speed, what's their current level of power, what's their current level of fitness, what's their current level of body composition. And I wouldn't be married to single one, a singular test within those categories, but I would break it down also of like, you need to have some sort of reliability component. And I find myself constantly toggling things that I think I can do pre and post that I can evaluate and cross-reference, right? And generally speaking, let's say that I'm doing a farmer's carry for distance to try to assess grip strength and, and fitness and relative strength overall. But I feel like a safer thing to do is in like a max back squat. The person oftentimes tells me midway through training, like I could probably do a back squat at the end. Like we'll definitely use back squat within training. And if we're good at our job, then it should parlay into improving your ability to carry something longer. And we'll just use that as a post-test. And every time we improve on the post-test and now we have to level up our testing to begin the next phase or the next iteration of this. But that like being committed to the pre and post-test, being committed to, I'm going to develop these general things that everyone there, like that should be universal. Like it, this, I have to really understand the efficacy of my training, the value of my training. We have to do things that are going to give a bigger, a higher ceiling for the athlete to perform it in their sport or their, their position. And then we go to work and say, okay, well, I know there's some blind spots and gaps. I need to pinpoint those and zero in on those and, and be honest and communicative with our sport coaches and our parents and everyone's associated in this big ecosystem of athlete development. And yeah, sometimes that feels like you're vulnerable and sometimes it admits weakness, but it's like, Hey, we're going to focus on these things. Cause that's what we're effectively asked to do. It doesn't mean that it's all encompassing. It doesn't mean that it's a, 
everything is going to be fine. Like you're, there's still got a lot of stuff, stuff to work. He's still got to swing a bat, throw a ball. He's still got to run routes. He's still got to do pass sets. He's still got to do stuff that is relative to the sport. Just now he or she has a better platform in order to do that at a consistently higher level. Can you give some examples of potentially using tests, whether it be on the force plates or, or some other screen where you use that? And it was like, okay, based off of these results, you know, bilateral squatting is off the table or how, how do you go about that? Yeah. So qualifiers, or let's start to look at standard deviation. One test is, is information. Multiple tests is a pattern. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's really nice about a bilateral force plate is the ability to detect multiple data points on something that cooperates your data. So for instance, if we're trying to determine asymmetry and if you tell me that asymmetry doesn't matter, you're disregarding the most important point that we're redundantly loading threshold based patterns that has some sort of direct impact on potential risk that if we're devoid of doing, like if you're going to tell me we don't do any bilateral patterns push to threshold redundantly multiple times, a, multiple, multiple reps, multiple sets, multiple times a week, then yeah. Okay. Asymmetries are irrelevant. You're just instituting this chaos within your training that you have no, no continuity from one session to the next. You're not building enough progressive overload. Sure. Like then that's an argument, but if you are, and I'll say that you abide by principles of training and progression, progressive overload, specificity, individuality, reversibility, and diminishing returns then you have to acknowledge the fact that we're going to do something redundantly in order to get something else. So I'm going to squat multiple times in a session, multiple times in a week. I'm going to deadlift. I'm going to do all of these things, which are bilateral fixed patterns. And they have a bilateral fixed bar. So if there's asymmetry in any of the joints, right? So if I look at ankle, knee, hip, and then we look at shoulder as these like shoulder, elbow, wrist, as these like kind of hinge, ball and socket, saddle joint, and then we look at back and some, some sort of rotary component going on there. You might have a pelvis and a thorax that's rotated a contra, and co in a counter fashion that when you fix the end points of the, where your hands are and where your feet are, and then in between the body has to adjust in space in the three-dimensional world, and you're pushing at the threshold of heavy, fast, or long, those are the three outlets that we do with any pattern. It goes really heavy, really fast, or really long, and eventually the body's going to figure out a way to strategize to get to point B. So get to a bottom, bottom of a squat, get to the top of the squat, start from the ground, stand up with a deadlift, et cetera, et cetera. And in between, if there is offset like tension, offset motor, offset something, that eventually that torque's going to go somewhere and might essentially take that small crack in the dam and expand it out. So telling me asymmetry is not relevant or significant or important is like telling me that you don't believe in principles of training because that's going to be essentially the the area that where this meets some sort of intersection or point of diminishing returns that no more what we're doing there. So having that inventory of information is critical, but it's not significant if it's a singular data point, like you need to be investigative enough to dive deeper. And one might be an anomaly, right? Let's say that you're looking at a force plate and you can essentially get average asymmetry, peak asymmetry. You can look at eccentric, concentric. You can look at it landing. And you see it all the time, especially if you're doing it in a non-sterile, non-testing environment, like a group or, or a weight room, there's things going on everywhere. And when a kid jumps in a weight room with 60 other people, an asymmetry might be actually the product of them just being in an environment that's not conducive to very sterile testing environment or reliable testing environment. They just might look left and right. And it might be just, okay, that number is it just an anomaly. They're just not necessarily something that's congruent with that. And that shouldn't have an impact on your training decision from not doing any bilateral exercise. That's not enough to substantiate don't do that. But if you start to see that pattern recurring, all the jumps, maybe you do a counter movement, not a counter movement. Maybe you do a repeat jump test. Maybe you do a depth jump. Maybe all of them. And you see eccentric, concentric landing. You see an average and peak. You see maybe an impulse asymmetry high. Maybe you see all these things are just now constantly this this number over and over. And then maybe you cooperate a little bit more, right? Maybe you do some movement assessments so through a functional movement screen or 3D maps. Maybe you look at a car's assessment. Maybe you even look at a table test looking at hip internal, external rotation, ab adduction, flexion, extension. You find consistency with this asymmetry. Now that is a significant number. If you have more than, let's say, four, five data points that are saying that person's asymmetrical, 
that eventually it's going to hit some sort of apex when it gets into that actual loading redundantly to threshold. And if you don't have any follow-up, again, this gets back into if you don't use testing to have any influence on your training decisions from your exercise selection and how you load those variable-wise, doesn't matter. Like, you're going to tell me that asymmetry is irrelevant. Of course it is. You're not going to use it to change anything. It's essentially unsubstantiating what you would normally have done, and it's hard for people to do. It's a lot of inertia. You know, show me your weight room. I can tell you what your program is probably going to be without actually looking at your physical program. Right. And that gets into this, like, back and forth of, like, it's all just... I just futile because when we break it down and we look at the testing, if you don't value it, then don't do it. But when we look at that, if I see consistency in pattern, I'll see my entire team has multiple data points of 15% of asymmetry on right, left, interlimb asymmetry when they jump and land, eccentric and concentric loading, where that loading and propulsion phase, that landing phase, that eventually when I start to squat them, that their organic natural pattern is now asymmetrical. And then when I push them to threshold, that asymmetry is now under load. There's a ton of torque. There's a ton of con contortion to that body. It's going to have some impact. Whether that's a direct injury right then and there or an injury over time, that's just the product of aggregate stress and area, or just leave the faulty patterns that don't lead to better force file put vertically. And you see squatting or deadlifting don't translate to improved performance jumping or sprinting or projectile like an object like a med ball. And like that part is like, that is the real game here. It's like, all right, well, if this person has some sort of feeling on what they can do from being asymmetrical, or if this person has some sort of leg tension force problem that's not really the, the product of their, their nervous system or their muscular system, but they're just biomechanics or their motor system, then yeah, I got to address that. And the exercises they choose based off of that should be influence based off of it. So what I would say on that is a force plate's a pretty good place to start. It's objective, it's standardized, it's reliable. It's going to have a live feedback on where they're at. So if they might not have an asymmetry on one day, but they have it another day just from sleeping wrong or playing sport, like, you know, it's hysterical. And one of the things that we found from doing GPS, so we use catapult and army, was our slot backs or A backs did basically this curvilinear pattern. It's down, ready, set, hot, and our A backs just, and a right A back, left A back, only turn right, only turn left for pretty much two hours. And you see like their right ankle on the, the right slot or the left hand comb, the left slot was really sore and beat up. And these kids now had issues. And at the time we didn't have force plate to really determine this, but you could see IMA right, IMA left, which is the change of direction or turning one way versus the other was substantial. We thought it was just some sort of funky data, but you break down the practice. Essentially we wanted to hammer that pattern. We did it over and over and over and over. Imagine the kid who only plays right guard. Imagine the kid who only plays left tackle. That means their left foot's in his retro stance or kick-stepping back, 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 back over and over and over again. And you ask them to go to the right side, they can't do it. They can't go left foot forward, right foot back. That creates some sort of problem when you start to load them redundantly with bilateral patterns. Now, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Squatting patterns are still important. These are going to be critical. And it just might mean I need to utilize an asymmetrical stance to load that more effectively. It might be I need your single leg stance or your unilateral stance entirely. But my point being is it's still going to get to, I need to improve body composition for adding more muscle or decreasing body fat. I need to improve my ability to generate force and power and run faster. These are all important things. You just might mean to address this, this asymmetricalness of the body, which everyone's going to have asymmetry. So the more we can accept that and the more we need to maybe adjust our programming to accommodate that, the better off we're going to be. So to answer your question after that, yes, yeah, like we should use some sort of Standardized test. And one thing that's nice about force plate, and this is by no way ship imagination of a plug for force play or whatever brand you think is best. But the truth is, is it's reliable. So from me to you to the next person could be successful with it right away. It could become high frequency and has another meaning altogether. Looking at what is your RSI, what's your your power per body mass, what is your your jump height. These are all critical things to understand. So we can look at it from an appraisal of movement potential to a just straight performance. And as I look at my programming and as I look at the, the intersection of those things, I should see positive relationships. I should see things that are maybe negative or, or counterproductive, like asymmetries go down. And I should see things that are productive and positive, like jump height, power, and maybe in terms of 
power per body mass or your reactive strength index, like RSI should go up or modified RSI. Those things should all improve. And having an inventory of where that is, like first off, it goes, okay, well, I can do split squats today, not maybe back squats. And I should see some sort of impact over that over time. What should we be looking at from a frequency standpoint? Because if we're really trying to use this to drive our decision-making, pre, pre and post-test doesn't seem like it would be enough. So how do we uh, balance our frequency to make sure we're making the right choices at the right time? So I'm going to say this in a way that hopefully, hopefully lands with strength conditioning coaches. The truth is force plates become more of an attendance tracker as opposed to just a performance tracking. Just like so, old school body weights, right? Yeah. So like when we get a kid, we'll get a group in and we do jump testing. I'm dual part knowing who was it actually the session that day, what time were they there as well as what their potential is an active day. So high frequency, I think is, is critical for a lot of things. It just has to be integrated into your program and supporting what it is. So like nice thing is whatever dashboard you're connecting your force plate to is doing attendance on that given day for you. So that's good. And you see someone missing on that day, it probably means they weren't there or maybe something else all entirely. You just need to notate that. So when we're thinking about all of the stuff that we have to do as strength conditioning professionals, high frequency tests, like a force plate that's reliable, that's a quick, that's easy, is a really good option. Not to only mention too, of like now with just cloud-based software, we can just sync it up right to a dashboard and we don't have to take time to transfer, transfer that information. Uh, I think when we look at high frequency stuff, let's say jump, jump height every week, the monotony of it, the lack thereof short-term change can be easily deter, make kids deterred or disenfranchised with that process. So you have to get out in front of that and say, not every week we're going to be up and to the right, but we're looking at it in terms of average. And you look at something like a wearable, like heart rate variability or heart, resting heart rate. These are all super high frequency things that we have exposure. I could check it two seconds and I could see where I'm at today in terms of activity level, what my readiness is, et cetera. Doesn't necessarily mean that's going to influence my decision. What I would say though, is in terms of stuff that's high frequency, it needs to be objective and really reliable because just the law of averages would say the more you do something, the greater the chance of something being bad. So if it's not good, have some sort of reliability component in there that's built in that makes it hard to screw up. You know, don't let human error mess things up. And then when it becomes more, more skill, like a table test or a movement assessment, I think it has to get a little less frequency, but also too, of like more skill takes more time, right? So something that takes a lot more time, like you look at a, a skin caliber body composition or a DEXA scan versus just getting on a bioelectrical impedance. Like, yeah, validity goes down, but the reliability goes up and we can do it more frequently. So it might mean, hey, maybe I'm not looking at body composition from a like hardcore science of influencing what I'm doing from a nutrition or bioenergetic perspective, but it might mean like just giving me some sort of indication of what level of progress I have from maybe lifestyle and behavioral change, right? So you'll do a body composition on a Monday coming off of a weekend, maybe a holiday weekend, you see body weight is up. Did we make some bad decisions over the weekend? We sure did. Okay, great. What can we do better next time? How can I support you to make better decisions to not overeat, not move at all, and just making sure you're taking care of yourself? Or it's the other end of it, there's weight gain guys who just don't eat or don't drink enough water. And you see that just the other way as well. So like when I would say frequency stuff, it's got to be really reliable. It doesn't diminish the value of high skill, less reliable tests. It just means the frequency in which we can do that with. But again, like you get into this, you know, your overall approach to testing, it has to have a positive influence on your, on your programming and, or an influence whatsoever, not, maybe not positive or negative, but depending on how your, your frame of reference is, but it has to have an influence on what you're doing programming wise. And if I see kids who have significantly less, less jump performance, right? Let's say we have a standard deviation of like three, right? Which is significant. And all of a sudden now we start to see a 15% drop in jump height. We have to evaluate that and what decisions we might be making in our training prescription. And let's say that I'm at this peaking of this mezzo and I have the highest amount of volume or intensity or density within a session, and they are significantly not ready for this. You have a decision to that point to make, right? Like you can make some sort of, some sort of overarching rule of like, nope, we're not doing what we did today. Sometimes there's a hard lessons are the best lessons. Like you decide to go out the next four 
okay, it's going to be really hard for you. I'm going to let you go through this, obviously safely and effectively, but you're going to have to learn consequence for your action. Or there's like the environmental, like we know from looking at central governor theory that the environment sometimes dictates whatever the human potential is. And routinely we see whatever it is from a energy storage standpoint, from a nervous system fatigue standpoint, from a muscular, muscular standpoint, fatigue wise, that people overcome these essentially obstructions to output readily and easily. And we have enough, enough things going on environmentally in college and professional weight rooms to say that, yeah, the psychology of what we're doing has as much an influence on what we're doing physiologically, but there's always a second order to that. And if I'm looking at it from, okay, the readiness isn't there, it's a good opportunity to teach this young person the value of going to bed earlier and taking care of their body when they're not training. It's also, I'm going to let the group kind of help me here a little bit and help this person get a great day regardless because they're there, right? That's, that's an underrated aspect of the athlete experience is that they're there. And a lot of times they want the, even when they're tired or they're not feeling it, to be there, to be, be rewarded for that, right? They don't want to be admonished and punished for the most like, Oh yeah, you, you, you didn't, you showed up or you're not prepared. Like in their mind, they did what they did something above and beyond and they probably could have found an excuse to not come or made up something or they're not, they're not ready to do it, but they're there. So finding a way to kind of bridge that gap of like, I know from a physiological preparedness standpoint, you don't have it, but in the other end of it, you got to get the value from that day because I got them and I might as well. And we only have about 32 and 32 sessions in off season for, for football in terms of winter and summer. So I got to make this one thirty two, one thirty second of this ratio work out for my favor and let the group take over. But the countermeasure might be the next day I might suck or yeah. might need to adjust some things after that. But that being said, all of that being considered, when you're thinking about high frequency testing, when you think about low frequency testing, you got to have some sort of understanding of the relationship with what that's going to have in your programming, what that's going to impact from the psychology of the value of programming, the the doubling of our saving time by not having to do body weights or not having to do attendance every time, but also too, like it becomes, becomes just monotonous form where they just get on there and just check the box and give no meaningful effort for it. You tap the well too often and you might need to find other ways to, to find that readiness potential from that athlete. Yeah, I'm actually seeing that. So we're still getting our baseline tests on a lot of our students because we have late additions and stuff. So the kids who have been here, like, we're doing this one again. Like, come on, we just did that. So you, normally, you know, in a routine, we get one every three weeks or so, but yeah, I can, you know, they're sort of getting fatigued. It happens pretty quick. So I'm glad yeah. you hit on that. Shut awesome, up, man. I hope everyone brought their notebooks. Yeah. Just shut up and do it. That's yeah. Just you. shut up and jump. I don't, what, what's so hard about it? Yeah, exactly. Chop wood, carry water and jump yeah. on the plate. Water the yeah. bamboo. That's it, man. That's, you want to bamboo grow for three years. That's it. Yeah. That's what we're doing here. Three years. Awesome, Corey. Thank you, man. All right. Thanks, Tim.